they have Parsis and Mercedes And they draw them out of school But they fail in every subject They pretend that it's cool But they don't have to care about their future life Because their daddy's gonna buy them everything until he dies As if I keep what I need you Welcome to Radical Minds here on WHBK 88.5 FM. The time is now 3 o'clock. Today on our show, we're going to be interviewing Pam Nogales of the Platypus Affiliated Society about the Occupy Chicago protests, which are part of a wider movement in various cities. Um, so Pam, what, how would you view these protests as, are they sort of a continuation of a prior set of protests like the perennial protests around the G7 meeting or other sorts of protest movements in the past, or are these actually a new and distinct political phenomenon with no real connection to preceding kind of big protest movements? Well, I guess there are two ways of answering that. One, in the ways in which um, the protesters themselves uh, talk about it, um, which is a continuation of what they consider continuation of the Arab Spring. Um, so in New York, in Wall Street, lots of the protesters said that, you know, the, the very impact from going to the streets um, and trying to challenge the authority, trying to challenge the government, was inspired by the Arab Spring. So that's one way um, of thinking about it. The second way of thinking about it would be in terms of, you know, what these movements remind us of, which I would venture to say they remind me of the kind of anti-globalization movement. I was too young to be, um, to experience the anti-globalization protests, but um, some people even within the milieu of platypus in New York who were part of the anti-globalization movement um, have been out there with us. Um, platypus is doing a series of talks uh, at the occupations in the different cities where we have chapters like New York and Chicago and Boston. And um, one member of the group who was a veteran of the anti-globalization protest said that a lot of the slogans, uh, a lot of the demands um, are being that are being made um, are reminiscent of, of the anti-globalization movement. So what is Platypus and why does it have an interest in these protests? Uh, Platypus is an organization that hosts the conversation on the left. Uh, what that means is that we invite uh, leftists, people who aspire to be leftists, people who have an interest and curiosity about transforming the world, to have conversations with us during our public fora, during our teach-ins, public interviews that we do on the pages of the Platypus Review, in order to reconstitute an emancipatory leftist politics. Um, we organize around campuses in New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, um, and various other cities, uh, including some overseas chapters that are in Germany, in London, um, as well as in the Netherlands, in Greece, and recently in India. And um, so that's, that's what we do. Um, what we're doing at these occupation protests is introducing some questions and sort of problems, uh, sort of questions around the problems of the left's presence as, um, you know, I think that part of what we're doing at these occupations is talking to those students and talking to people who are there and asking them, what do they consider this movement to be for? And uh, some of the members in New York, as well as in Chicago, have been introducing uh, platypus in terms of reconsideration of Marxist politics today. So how does Marxism speak to us today? Now, there are other existing Marxist groups that will look at these protests and will say something along the lines of what these protests are is, an, is a sign that the, ma the mass of people are ready to break with capital. 
but it seems that this is would you say this is in some sense premature or in some sense that these protest movements are unripe for any sort of definitive break that way or is it really like in what way is this analysis when they either do or don't share and why um i think that for the most part these protests are riddled by a great deal of confusion um those people who are younger who are there, uh, like I said, they understand themselves as a continuation of something like the Arab Spring, um, that they have a responsibility as youth in this country to um, protest the actions of their governments. But um, it's really unclear what the movement, quote unquote, stands for. I think that the, its most vocal um, participants have talked about this movement in terms of against corporate greed um, or keeping people uh, or making people pay or be responsible or um, et cetera. This is, I think, um, the reason why you have people who uh, attend these protests who you know no one would consider to be obviously not Marxist, but wouldn't even consider them to be against capitalism. Um, but someone who uh, people that say, well, you know, it's right what you're doing out here because what you're doing is demanding that um, these financiers, these 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 investors, these these people um, are put to justice that that they need to pay, and so this is, I think, a component of the kind of ideological confusion at work. You can have Zizek, Naomi Klein. Um, go and Cornell West and Amy Goodman in the streets of Wall Street and say to the protesters that they're right because, you know, this is a kind of unfair situation that they're in. But it's very unclear what that adds up to as far as politics is concerned. Now, how would this be different from, say, other, like, what, what, what would the alternative to this form of protest be? How is it that in the present moment, we don't really have any sort of recognition or there's no, there doesn't seem to be a possibility of any other sort of political response other than these protests as problematic as they are. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I forgot to mention that Joseph Stieglitz was also there. And so it's sort of indicative um, of the kind of confusion that's at work where Joseph Stieglitz can speak and the next day Zizek can speak and it's the same crowd that's cheering them on. Um, or Naomi Klein, et cetera. I mean, um, as far as the alternative form of political expression and sort of thought, I mean, one of the things that is missing from these protests is the the time and, um, yeah, the time to sort of think about what it would take to reconstitute a left. Um, I think that what's recently happened in Chicago and in New York are uh, the inclusion of um, the unions. And uh, I think that the younger people in these protests have... Um, they, they feel energized by the uh, inclusion of unions, but it really begs the question of what this is for. Uh, I think it underlines the problem that at the end of the day, I mean, these unions are not going to do anything but end up voting for the Democratic Party. And so what is the kind of uh, self-assured uh, sentiment about when the junior, when the unions join, other than just kind of showing us the, the kind of predetermined end of these protests, which is the you know, re-election of, of Obama. Um, so, I mean, all of that is a kind of negative critique, but I think that what's really necessary, therefore, are questions about how do you actually rebuild a left? How do you rebuild a left at an international level? And what kind of conversation would have to happen on an international level in order to make these considerations affect the political context? Now, these protests come out of a certain kind of historical context. I think that we've, we've already mentioned at some point the anti-globalization movement and the broader question of 1990s politics from which like the entry of unions into something like Occupy Wall Street could be read and probably will be read as a sort of break with 90s politics, a break with separation from the working class. But that also, as, as you said, it raises the question of sort of depoliticization of shilling for the Democratic Party. Is this a is, is this divide sort of a broader historical is there a broader reason for it? I mean th I think that the that question of sort of breaking from the working class versus turning into shilling for the Democrats has been a feature of political movements in America since the 60s at least when you have for the first time a real 
question open up about whether Democratic Party can be the means for change in America. Um, trying to, I'm trying to figure out your question. I, uh, maybe you... Well, what's sort of the context against which these protests are taking place? What's the history that makes their present confusion in some sense? What is it about the past that makes these protests take on the, the amorphous form they do now? Um, okay, well, I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, there's there's the anti-financial capital bit. There's also the kind of um, idea of, like, completing the Arab Spring. There's also just sort of um, youth on the streets um, idea. And then there's, there's an attempt to have a critique of the Democratic Party. And I think that it comes from the fact that, you know, what the death of the anti-war movement here was, was basically the, you know the the new new SDS or the new SDS and and the anti-war movement participants and ending up voting for Obama and so it's a kind of mea culpa in one way because the same you know protesters the ones that are a little bit older like in their mid 20s like I am did experience the anti-war movement and were probably in the streets and organizing people in fact I know for sure because some of the veterans of the anti-war movement are there, are present in Wall Street. So I think it's a form of a kind of mea culpa. I mean, as far as the deeper history is concerned, I mean, um, uh, I mean, working class politics, I mean, the working class in the United States is conservative. So um, the unions becoming involved in these protests is not going to radicalize the, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street movements. In fact, it's it shows how conservative it actually is because the idea that these students are feeling a kind of self-assuredness as a result of the UAW, et cetera, joining their protests already is a kind of defeat because what that really does mean is that these protests are just going to be um, a kind of predetermined agreement on the re-election of the Democratic Party candidate. So... Now, you mentioned a predetermined agreement, but these protests, it's not as though they're going out there being Occupy Wall Street so Obama gets reelected or Occupy Chicago so that Obama gets reelected. In what sense would you say that this is predetermined when it's not the case that there's, I mean, the original call for Occupy Wall Street came from some anarchist collect. I can't quite remember which one it was. And there it was definitely not. Um, um, I don't. I don't think that, I mean, this is where the ideological confusion comes in. What I'm trying to say, I think, is that, you know, maybe these folks, like um, I was speaking to a colleague of mine yesterday, maybe these people who are um, in in front of uh, the, the voting, you know, they have their, they have their ballots in their hands and they, they recognize that they're just doing the same thing that they've done four years ago. Uh, maybe they'll be more upset about doing the same thing. The, the question is, is Occupy Wall Street creating some kind of opportunity that allows for that not to be the end point of these protests. Is this movement going to create, um, is this movement going to create the political conditions, the conditions for something other than just voting for the Democratic Party? And now we'll take a brief break for a few public service announcements. Están listos. Manos arriba. Okay, revise todas las pistas, practique mi set y Uh, we apologize for any technical problems that may have happened. Um, we believe, well, we're going to go back to the interview. Uh, so, how does the question? How does this idea? You were talking about an ideological confusion, but it seems that the protesters don't share it, or they don't have as a clear view of the fact that their activities really aren't making an alternative to what's in this November going to be. Oh, we occupied Wall Street for however many for over a year. Now let's all go to the voting booths. How is it that this outcome, which you see as inevitable, isn't one that how how is it that there's a gap here between what protesters are doing, what you see them as doing, and what they see themselves as doing? I guess that's the problem of sort of recognition, self-recognition, self-criticism. Um, 
I think it's difficult to tell what people actually think this will achieve, to be quite honest with you, because it's not being represented by an organization of any kind. It's disparate. I think that there are people who are leaders within these occupations, but they are often uh, reluctant to step up and sort of speak for, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Chicago, etc. Um, I think that in general, though, um, the people who we've spoken to as platypus at Wall Street uh, are not clear that this will topple Wall Street or topple the United States. Um, others who are there, I think that I think that they they think that what they are doing is planting the seeds for a new kind of leftist culture. Um, you know, horizontality, et cetera. I, I think I would put quotes around new because it's a rehearsal of the, you know, it's a rehearsal of the kind of new SDS stuff that we saw at the anti-war movement. And you can see by attending the assemblies, um, they have, uh, uh, I think that they have them now every day perhaps, but the assemblies use um, sort of facilitating tools in which, um, that are driven by participatory democracy. And so when someone speaks, you, you show agreement, you show disagreement, Decisions are made uh, largely on consensus level, although I just recently heard that this changed. I think now it's sort of 90%. I'm not sure they were having some troubles. But so, I mean, what is this stuff about, uh, really? Like, if that's the content of the politics in terms of, like, f the way in which an assembly meeting is facilitated is the content of the politics. That really there's very little conversation about ideas. Like, what are the goals of a movement that conceives of itself as being particularly mobilized by horizontality and participatory democracy and how does it conceive of itself in terms of creating something new or eradicating with you know the totality of sort of capitalist society from these pockets of protests i don't think that they in themselves are clear on it i don't something that platypus is going to try to do in the next coming weeks is bring some people who at least can identify as being an organizer within these movements onto the campuses where we have chapters in order to have these conversations. And I think that, you know, to the extent that we've been going to the occupation movements, some of the questions that we have been asking is, what do you conceive of this? How do you conceive of the Occupy movement? And what do you think it will accomplish? But it's a mixed bag. Um, we've gotten very many different things. Now, the reason why I say that it's predeterminately going to end up by supporting the Democratic Party I think it's just, I mean, I, I think it's quite obvious. I don't think that this movement is actually creating uh, new conditions for political consciousness that would develop something like, you know, I mean, certainly not like a third party alternative. And so what is it actually doing? We're going to have a brief pause for a message from our sponsors. Attention GIs. If you're planning to use the post 9-11 GI Bill to attend school anytime this year, you need to take action to help us make sure you get your benefits. Get eligibility and benefits information online at gibill.va.gov or text GI Bill to 99702. Visit gibill.va.gov today to apply for the education benefits you've earned or text GI Bill to 99702 to learn more. And thank you for your service to our country. So we've previously seen a mass outpouring of youth around rallying around the Democratic Party in the Obama mania craze and the circumstances surrounding Obama's election. But that was, had a much more clear view of, oh, we are rallying around to get this person elected. And in what sense would you say that some of that sort of mentality has carried over into these protests? Are they simply a less clear repeat of Obama mania, or is it something different? I mean, the Obama mania was fueled by its own version of ideological confusion. Because I think even on the left, the, you know, the purported left, um, the student left in particular, had some kind of delusion that, you know, either the worst kind of delusion that Obama was some kind of anti-war president, which was very clear that he was not, you know, even in his own, like, I don't think that he was dishonest about this. You know, he never said that he was an anti-war president, but... Um, or they thought that this was some form of progress in terms of the election of a black president. And, um, you know, it was, I think, very clear that the new SDS movement in part fell apart as a result 
of the mobilization for the Democrats. Um, a lot of these people were absorbed into the Democratic Party party campaign. Um, so that's one just one sort of uh, historical backdrop to this stuff, which, like I said, I mean, I've, I've literally seen those same people that were part of this anti-war movement out there in Wall Street as if nothing has happened. Um, I think that what gave the Obama media more direction, um, at least in the lead up to it, was the anti-war character of the student left during the 2005, 2006, 7 and 8 sort of moment. And this seems more, uh, I think, more um, sweeping in one way, right? We're upset that uh, something like um, priorities in, by the government of the economy can create sort of un instability and inequality. Um, it's not about one war. It's not about, um, it's not about uh, even the president, perhaps. But this just raises all sorts of problems that were already there, I think, in the new SDS movement, meaning the new SDS movement, you know, at its most kind of like radical, you know, in the aspirations of its most radical members, maybe, was self-conceived as a way to give rise to a radical left in some capacity. You know, it, it didn't have its act together. Um, and there was a lot of confusion as to how that would be the case. But that's really like the sole reason why Platypus actually got involved in the new SDS, that it was supposed to provide the context for open conversation and debate and discussion as to how to rebuild the left, period. I was supposed to be an umbrella organization, but never even sort of lived to its own aspirations. Um, so that's, I think, for some, for reasons that I think are about... Um, the relationship to the anti-war movement, it seemed like a much more focused uh, sort of protest movement. Whereas this feels like, well, if you're not for, uh, you know, the democratic policies in the United States, then what are you for? Um, and, you know, and so some of the bad critiques that have come out, I think, of the Occupy movement are just like, well, you need to make really pragmatic demands. You know, I think there's a woman in the Wall Street protest walking around with a sign that says concrete demands. You know, she like makes certain demands. And I think that in Chicago, what I just heard is that there um, there's a committee that's formulating something similar, like concrete demands that that that, that, that people can get behind and things of like this. Um so, I mean, maybe it's more, quote unquote, like radical potential in terms of like uh, some in terms of building some kind of international movement that questions the very nature of economic inequality. Right. Which one can see as a kind of seeds in the Occupy movement is its sort of worst part because of the ideological confusion around these concerns that it turns into anti-greed or, you know, keeping people responsible. So its most sort of radical aspirations are actually distorted and become its sort of, um, maybe its, its worst weaknesses, in a sense. You mentioned a, uh, quite a few times a sort of anti-greed protest, as though what the question the questions of, of of Wall Street of the recent financial crisis crash were a question of like moral cupidity instead of assist, systemic problems within the way in which people consume and produce. Do you th is there sort of a drive to under like how does this sort of more systemic view of the issues raised by the crisis get received or does it? Is it sort of marginalized in favor of an understanding that sort of Wall Street is the problem and somehow governmental action is the solution? Even at the same time, there's sort of this idea of like Wall Street works hand in hand with government. It, this is what I'm gathering from the way to protest. Again, as you mentioned, it's difficult to get a sense of what they're about, but it seems like these two ideas, government as part of the problem because it's in bed with Wall Street and then government as the solution because it's somehow potentially answerable that like these two ideas are intention and yet that's not under it, it sort of plays out as like oh wall street is greedy and corrupting and and this is sort of a 
this this doesn't really answer the questions I think behind well why is it that way why is it that we that the way in which we coordinate the sort of production and consumption of our across like time and space takes the form of what 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 what's described as greed yeah I mean I think it's a problem of like the left. I mean, in sense, you know, like why Joseph Stieglitz can go out there and get cheered by the same crowd that is just like cheered like someone like Zizek, you know, who purportedly wants to rile up people for the overthrow of capitalism or something, um, I think has to do with the kind of incoherent or rather the kind of barbaric political moment that we live in, in which people can feel as though making someone responsible um, by critiquing their greediness is a way of holding them accountable, is the way of creating a more um, more equal or uh, uh, opportunities in the world. I, I think that... Um, So it's not that there isn't some kind of recognition of the reconstitution of structural inequalities. I mean, again, like it's rather disparate and it's really confused. And there are people out there. I mean, there's also the sectarian left that's out there. Right. And they're not saying like, you know, just like greedy people or whatever. And they're opportunists. And sometimes they may get behind those people that said this is just about like corporate greed. But at the end of the day, in their own meetings, they actually, you know, um, they don't sort of think about it in this way. Now, Uh, So the question, I guess, is of like political consciousness and what kind of political consciousness is able to um, provide um, the conditions under which these problems can be really thought through in order to build something other than, you know, drum circles and, um, uh, you know, sleeping on the street, you know, as an effective response to these issues. Um, Now, supporters of the movement would probably say, and it's, un- and it's unfortunate we couldn't have somebody actually involved with the organization of these protests on the show today, they would probably claim that something like the participatory democracy or the sort of general meeting is sort of forming a place for discussion of these issues. In what way is that not the case? In what way is that discussion inadequate to the problems of the present? Well, there isn't discussion happening. I mean, that's part of the problem. Um even in the assemblies, you know, what happens is someone gets up and says, you know, I am running a committee. My committee is making armbands for the activists in, you know, this Occupy movement. If you want to be part of this, please let me know, you know, et cetera, and something's formed. There are constant sort of procedural conversations about how to adequately relate to the other person who's speaking. Um, and I think, I mean, look, there's, So there's that. There's that problem. And also, you know, recently my colleague um, in Platypus, she was at the assembly. She she told me that she was in the audience. And um, and all of a sudden, you know, people recognized that the Reverend Jesse Jackson had walked into by the assembly. So people started sort of saying, oh, you know, Reverend Jesse Jackson. And one of the organizers was like, oh, well, you know, we should really let him speak now. As far as I know, the way in which you speak at these assemblies is you have to get on stack. You have to get on a list of people that can speak. In order to get on stack, you have to actually pass it through this committee that uh, lets people know when it's appropriate to uh, address certain topics that are related to the conversation that has been happening up until that part of the discussion. And so there's no way that Jesse Jackson just coming in with his entourage in the middle of this assembly has, quote unquote, followed procedure. Um And so he ends up actually getting on the stack. He gets on stage or in in the sort of center of this this area and addresses the crowd and people go nuts, you know, in a good way. People go crazy. And, um, you know, and it's sort of like, okay, what is this stuff about? Is it mere posturing then? Right. Because, of course, unlike those um, unlike those people who were in the assembly, who were young people, who were students or who were curious people, Jesse Jackson was actually talking about ideas. He you know, he's. He's a he's an ideologue. He's up there, sort of saying like this is what this is what I think is wrong with the world. And I, at the end of the day, apparently, it was a lot of sort of demagogy. Um, but so you know, my friend Tana, uh, who's also a member of Platypus, she said, well, you know, it seems unfortunate to me. I think she addressed the crowd at one point that 
all of these people are here gathered together, but we don't have, we're not having an education that give a, gives us more awareness or like helps us develop a kind of political recognition of what kind of moment we live in. We're just talking about how to agree with someone. I mean, I don't think she said that last part, but it was, you know. Um, and so those conversations about politics, about the problem of the left today, those conversations about what it would mean to reconstitute something like a left that could challenge not only the Democratic Party, but all of the kind of bad leftist parties that exist in places like Europe, like those kinds of conversations don't happen at these protests. They just don't. Uh, we'll like to remind our listeners on WHBK to, about uh, the People's Radio, Public Affairs uh, alternating Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. Join Southside together organizing for power alternating Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. for the People's Radio. This program will cover the latest issues in the struggle for human rights and racial and economic justice on the South Side of Chicago from the perspectives of tenants and organizers on the ground in the struggle. And now for another message from our sponsors. When I was young, I knew something was wrong. My mother would forget to pick me up from school. Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems. And more. Then she remembered something. Me! My mom worked hard to be in recovery. And now she is here for me. Hi, Mom! You ready? Let's go! For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So it seems that at one point historically, you do have the kinds of social movements, you do have the kinds of political presence in the form of like political parties that can address these issues of what is the left, what does it mean to be on the left, what can the left do to change the circumstances of the day, and now we don't. Is that basically a fair summary of the sort of history of the left from 19... And I mean, basically the early part of this century all the way until the present as one of now the the problem being the absence of anything that can really live up to what it used to be used to mean to be on the left. Um, I think that the history of the left in the 20th century could be characterized by a history of defeat. And so I think that that's an accurate sort of characterization. Um but I, you know, first of all, two caveats. One, that there's no going back or something. You know, it's not like re-inhabiting the aspirations of something like the radicals of the Second International, for example, wouldn't be quite adequate to the moment in which we live in. Actually, the, the biggest difference of all between that moment and ours is that we don't have something like an international proletariat movement. Um, and the fact that it the international movement that was in the early 20th century failed means that we can't simply re-inhabit those politics. So what do they mean to us then? What do these movements, what do these like political attempts to transform the world, what do they, what do they mean? Um, how, how shall we learn from them? What are the lessons to be learned? You know, I think often when I read about people like Luxembourg, um, I, I think, you know, how, how powerful it must have been to have discussions with, with, with people in her own party and have substantial disagreements, but that those disagreements then sort of, they weren't an exercise in kind of, um, in, in sort of intellect, but rather they, they were affecting decisions around sort of organizing and, and the futurity of, of the party. They were, they were decisions and conversations about the interpretation of the history of the left um, that had, you know, immediate, if not long-term effects on w what the left would look like. We are in, by no means in a position to do that. Um, we don't, you know, we don't, have a burgeoning leftist movement here and it's not and I think that you know to say this it's not this kind of abstract pessimism I think what it really is is sort of questioning what are the conditions that we live in today and in what way would a leftist politics be adequate to those historical possibilities that lie latent within our present how to recover these possibilities today what would it mean to do so and you know 
for me at least as a Marxist in Platypus, what does the history of the Marxist left have to teach us? Or do we have any lessons to learn from the great political aspirations of an international revolution? So how would we make this sort of new beginning to the left? And what does Occupy Chicago do to either open up the space for its beginning or block it even more thoroughly? Um, it's potentially both. I mean, I, I think that insofar as, you know, students are walking out of NYU, the new school, Columbia University, to Wall Street to have conversations with each other, Curious people from all over are coming to Wall Street, Chicago, all of these occupied cities and, you know, asking themselves, I think, in a sincere way, in a sincere way, those who are young enough to be sincere, um, what what transforming the world would look like. You know, I had a colleague of mine from NYU who was a labor organizer back in the day, I think, when he was in college. Now he's a graduate student. And he knew that he knows that I'm a leftist and we had spoken about um, our politics before. And he wrote me an email and he said, Pam, is this what the revolution looks like? I don't think he's being facetious, meaning, I, you know, like you can call him naive, but I think that he's really trying to imagine like what would political transformation for our generation in our moment today look like? Does it look like this? You know? If, if we have an argument that it doesn't, or that this, this isn't actually a political revolution, this is not a social revolution, rather, um, then, you know, we have to, I think, platypus, you know, like we as like members of an organization, like I would, I would say, um, we have to kind of put our money where our mouth is um, in terms of engaging with people who are curious about leftist politics, but are caught up in ideological confusion that's driving these occupation movements, but nonetheless have an aspiration to learn from this moment, that they, their political imagination is being formed by their participation within these protests. And this is where the danger comes in as well, right? Because if what you learn from it is that you should have been harder on corporate greed or something, that that's what the left should look like, then that's a block to like emancipatory politics. Now, of course, there th these ideas of participatory democracy, of horizontality, and of sort of being against greed, they don't they don't come out of nowhere. It's not some sort of spontaneous... As much as the imagination of the people who support these ideas want... It, it's not that these ideas come out of nowhere. They, they've, they grew out of sort of a certain kind of political scene, I think. And they have their own sort of political history in the way that ideas about, like, workers' revolution today have a political history how in, in in some sense i think like there there's a way in which one in which defenders of these ideas are going to look to occupy chicago and they're going to be say something like look this is what we've always been talking about this is the movement that recognizes a new form of social organization and horizontality or whatever why are these what make what is it about the history that makes these ideas inadequate almost before they were thought of I mean, look at a, at a very basic level, you know, there is just a rehearsal of the new SDS going on here. I mean, it's, I just put it concretely. I mean, the facilitating tools are not just created by the SDS. The new SDS didn't invent like facilitating tools, but they use them. They use their the assemblies, they use them at their conventions, et cetera. It's all there. It's the same, it's the same stuff. You know, also, um, you know, for example, something like the the, the mediator um, will look for people of color, people of alternative sexuality, et cetera. I don't know how quite you look for alternative sexuality, but apparently this is one of the criteria that gets you, you know, closer to the top of the stack because the rationale behind it is that um, these people haven't been given a voice throughout history and their agency has been taken away. Thus, they should have a chance to speak perhaps sooner than others in this particular meeting. This is like informed by a politics, you know, it's informed by a politics of a politics of the oppressed, um, a politics of, you know, the subaltern a politics of, you know, that um, that that though what they're doing in these meetings, what they're doing in these meetings is providing political empowerment through participation of decision making. The point would be to say, actually, that that is politically disempowering 
meaning to have endless meetings, to have like five hour meetings, six hour meetings in which nothing is decided because there's sometimes these meetings like go on. And for example, what happened in the Chicago meeting was that at the end of the meeting, they were supposed to agree what statement to provide for the protest against the um, anniversary of the Afghanistan war. And they didn't get their act together and nothing happened. They couldn't make a decision. Hundreds of people in a park all trying to decide in a statement coming from Occupy Chicago about the Afghanistan war and they couldn't get their act together. And th they, that was an opportunity that was lost because it happened the next day and there was no statement from Occupy Chicago. It, it's the same, it's the rehearsal of the same thing. And it does come from this idea that participatory democracy provides political empowerment by including everyone in the decision-making practices of these movements. You know, it's, yeah. And this is, of course, in some sense, right, by including everyone in the decision-making, what ultimately happens is, as you mentioned, no decision ever gets made. Their input into the process is, the process doesn't lead anywhere. Their input might as well not have been given because it doesn't affect things. Um, I, I think that is a pretty powerful critique, but where does this, where does this sort of come from? Like, is there a specific like you, as you mentioned, these these tools are not new. They were around in the USDS. They they've sort of been with us for a while. But do these like is there a historical moment that gives rise to this idea of well, what we really need is forms of decision making that don't make decisions instead of what we need is a party that can do things for us, that can take control of politics, that can take control of the nation, that can break through the barriers of capital for politics. How does that, what, what causes that shift that sort of, I, I guess we'll call it the post-Marxist turn that, that characterizes this form of politics? Well, I mean, is this has to do with the kind of um, legacy of the new left and, you know, what what is still with us from the new left? I mean, it seems to me that a critique of something like a political party, um, a critique of a leftist imagination of the demand for a proletariat party um, does come from the disenchantment with old leftist politics, right? The politics of the old left um, and the left of the 20s and the 30s. And the response, I think, in the 1960s of the of the earlier period was that, you know, and, you know, look, some of these critiques, I want to separate two things that like there there's the way in which the critique actually informs the politics. But then there's also the way in which the old left and the failures of the old left leave a kind of bad inheritance and condition any new form of political left during the 1960s. So I don't think that, you know, um, I, I don't. In, recently I went to an event in which someone was like very nostalgic for the left in the 1930s as if the old left was some kind of like in the 1930s was some kind of high watermark of you know the Marxist left or something like this you know and what they were talking about was the New Deal um, and you know to have an imagination in which the New Deal is the high watermark of the left in this country is a pretty impoverished imagination you know where the the communist Stalin, the Stalinized Communist Party in the United States ends up supporting basically uh, Roosevelt. That's ideally what happens. Uh, or, you know, that's basically what happens. Um, I don't think that that's anything to be nostalgic about. So there's one thing, right? There's the problem of the old left and the way in which it dealt with its own sort of inadequacies um, and failures and political inabilities. And then there's that. And then there's the critique of the new left, of the, by the new left, of the old left which has its own sort of like problematic misconceptions. But one of the misconceptions was this idea of political organization, that political organization, political parties in and of themselves um, were undermining some kind of democratic spirit of the people, that they were not politically empowering, but they were disempowering. And something that I think lingers from the new left to the present is... Um, 
you know, something that was very present during the new SDS movement during the anti-war moment, which is that you can build a society within a society. You can build your utopic society within the already established order. So this participatory democracy, I think, at the at its you know at its core, has this idea that you build the movement, you create the organization, um, in in the image of the society that you want to see. So it's a means and ends problem in which it sort of collapses into one thing that the organization that you are making is the society that you are building right and so that was that was a very active sort of political imagination framework around the anti-war movement which i think is returning today it's just still there it's not returning it's just never left one of the sorts of ways and so Right. In some sense, we can see this as simultaneously a repeat of the old left mistake, and that becomes shilling for the Democrats the way that the Communist Party in the 1930s could to some, some extent, I mean, it would be a little unfair to the 1930s Communist Party, but not much to say it's essentially shilling for Roosevelt. It's the Democratic Party radicalized, you know, seemingly radicalized, but at the same time depoliticized. And also the new left in terms of its organization, you know, not here it's not really a failure of the organizational model so much as it's a failure to learn from the previous round what can is there like can is the sort of action that Platypus takes when it sort of tries to talk about these issues going to have an effect of maybe bringing around a, a memory that oh this is we're not doing something new and radical we're actually rehashing past movements and we need to go ahead and learn from what they did, what they stood for, in a different way than just sort of uh, writing a heliography and acting the same way. I think that one way that um, members of Platypus have put it, I think Chris Chris Catron in an article has said this at one point, um, that to put it more at its most sort of direct... Um, would be to say that the history of the left is basically a theory of the present. It's it's a way of understanding present possibilities, present limitations, in the way in which they're manifested. And so, of course, right, like, through that framework, what does it mean to be nostalgic for the 1930s, right? Because it's, like, already a kind of predetermined failure um, to be nostalgic for, like, the concessions made by the communists to the Democratic Party or something. You know, like, what does it mean to, you know, go around saying that you want to defend the gains of the welfare state? What is that? Um, so, I mean, in terms of the way in which the early 20th century period, the Second International Radicals speak to us today, that's a problem to be worked through. I mean, I think that those of us in Platypus consider the history of the left something to be worked through in our work um in large part you know what we do in our public fora is allow a particular kind of imagination to speak and um form a debate and sort of curate a discussion about it whether it be you know a kind of position of anti-imperialism that leftists do think is historically sort of they're taking it from a moment in history and applying it to the present or um you know whether it be something like um Israel-Palestine, which, you know, has looked very differently throughout the 20th century. Um, so it's not a hagiography. It's not, it's not, you know, um, I think a kind of return or um, a praising of a particular moment as if it had, like, the answers to the present. Um, but it's more negative in the sense of, do we really want to commit the same mistakes? Do we really want to make the same... Do we really want to just inhabit the confusion of an earlier moment? Or do we want to be able to understand how this confusion and defeat has actually provided worse context um, in the present to create an emancipatory politics? And as far as I'm concerned, because the left is dead, Platypus's attempt to work through history and the history of the left is an attempt to give the present a theory of possibility it's a, it's a way of thinking about what is possible today that doesn't re-inhabit doesn't rehearse the old defeats 
but this isn't something where you think that oh there is a certain program that we know what it is we just need to find we just need to attract people to it the way that so many of these leftist groups you mentioned view the, they they view themselves as having the right program for the time everybody just needs to follow our program and the world will be a better place yeah i mean platypus is not a political party there isn't a program um i think that in terms of creating a program for the present is would be premature i mean i'm um yeah i mean i i don't i i don't know what else to say in terms of that i mean th- there are sectarian lefts today in the united states for example um who will say that we are the revolutionary proletariat party you know join us you're joining the vanguard of the proletariat it's a very specious claim i think that you know some tiny sectarian group is building the revolution even though they were created like I'm thinking of one particular organization, but like 40, 50 years ago, and nothing has happened. So, I'm not sure. So, how would we address the current crisis of the left, the current confusion that Occupy Wall Street is, or represents, or in some way is influenced by, and you know, also advances itself? How would we address that problem then, productively, in your opinion? I mean, we provide. Um, opportunities for political reflection. I mean, as an organization that is invested in working through the problems and possibilities of the present, this is an opportunity insofar as those who are seriously and sincerely engaged in thinking about social transformation to join us in thinking about what this may look like, you know, it, you know, and that you know, what that call would mean is, you know, having discussions with members of the group, coming to events that we host that, you know, we try very hard to, I think, host these discussions on campus in order to clarify what our moment is about. It's a real shame. I read a New York article this morning, New York Times article this morning, in which they try to get a quote from a uh, an organizer and the uh, journalist said this was declined that you know the idea that we were demanding a representative for the protest you know this was this was not taken up on principle and it's I think it's a bit of a sham I think that's a that's a that's a sad situation you know because there's no moment to reflect there's no opportunity to think about what is this a statement about So how, how, right, so in some sense you're not, it, it's not even clear then that there is a way beyond something like Occupy Wall Street or the, or the sort of Occupy movements that have sprung up in the sense that one can't just say, oh, what you should be doing instead is this. So, are, and as we've talked about a bit about how there are opportunities for leftism, but what do you think will, what do you think the effect is going to be on people who go to these protests who become politicized through them and who don't end up considering this sort of let's think about social transformation, let's think about what the consequent let's think about what our actions are mean today. What what do you think will happen to people who don't take up that call? I think they're going to become rather cynical because I think that what's going to end up happening is that these people will go to the polls, right? And they'll be faced with the same option, the Republicans, the Democrats, and they'll vote Democrat. And they'll be like, that's right. That's what I did four years ago. And then I did this Occupy thing. And that didn't work out. And really nothing works out, right? Like I, you know, I campaigned for the Democratic Party. And then I was at Occupy Wall Street. And neither of those avenues actually helped me figure out what was wrong with the world, how I was a part of any kind of political alternative or opportunity. And you know, that's just the way the world is. I think that, you know, yeah, I think that that's, that's what would happen. I think in large part, that's what will happen. That's a quite depressing picture for what's, that's a quite depressing picture for, of the effects of these sort of social movements that are springing up today. But I can't, I can't really say that that's, that's not what's going to happen. Um, so in what way, is there a sort of an, any alternative to what to platypus or you or cynicism? Is there any other way? 
But see, you see, the, where the cynicism sort of springs from is the, you know, the misrecognition that this is actually a movement that has the seeds for social transformation. I think that one of the things that one of my colleagues um, and also a member of Platypus, Jeremy Cohen, said in New York when he gave his teaching um, at you know Liberty Square, he said, you know, we have to come to terms with the fact that this is not going to topple the United States. So let's think about what this actually is. This is a gathering a lot of people who have some kind of vague interest in politics and who are disenchanted with the state of affairs. So let's take it up as this kind of opportunity. Because if it's a different type of opportunity, if one sort of has this delusion that what's happening in Wall Street is going to topple the United States, I think that we treat it in such a way that we're setting up ourselves for disappointment. And I think those individuals are setting up themselves for becoming cynics in the future. And so platypus can only just be true to itself and true to its time and say, well, this is an opportunity for potential reflection on the state of affairs today. And that's how we're treating it. Thank you very much for taking the time to be on Radical Minds, where you can say more than five words at a time about what's wrong with the left. <laughs> Thanks, Watson. <laughs> Stand up and 